Amen. Well, it is Valentine's Day, um, and I don't have a message on St. Valentine, but, um, you know, something about Valentine's Day. My wife and I, we got married August 14th, 2010. We've been married going on 11 years this year, uh, which is wild. Um, but Valentine's Day is February 14th which is the exact six-month mark. So when we got married, little did I know that there would be, until death do us part, pressure. Like, the six, the halfway mark is the big day. It's like, ah. Oh. So, but it's actually a, a, a joy. Uh, Meg really likes Valentine's Day. She likes all the hearts and stuff. She'll buy heart decorations just to hang up after Valentine's Day, and I, okay, honey, uh, it's not my, not my, not my uh, first choice in decorations, but it's, it's great, and I love it, and I love her, so it all works out, so, um, but we're, <laughs> good answer, <laughs> yeah, amen, well, we're going to talk about God's love this morning, and I, before we even get started, I just kind of, feel, I want to read something, uh, just as a descriptor. The, um, and this wasn't part of my message, I just want to start with this premise, because Paul, the Apostle Paul, was dealing with a church whose culture was competitive, backbiting, immoral, and all kinds of goofiness going on in a certain culture, and Paul had to give them a reference for what love actually was. And in the book of Corinthians, let me grab this, in the book of Corinthians, right in the middle, he defines what love is. And, if, and, I'll, just, and I'll just read it. Verse, uh, Corinthians chapter 13, If I speak with tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I suffer my body to be burned and do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now he defines it so they know what it is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. It bears all things, believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never fails. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, God, that you are love. God, that you don't just love people. You don't just show your love, Lord, it's who you are. It's your nature, it's your character, and Father, we need to look at what your word describes it and defines it as. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to share from your word. God, I pray that you would anoint me to speak your word this morning. To correctly divide your word that we would be encouraged this morning, and I just pray, Father, that you would reveal your heart to us. God, for those who have had hang-ups and disappointments, for those who have had their hope deferred, Lord, I pray that you would show your love this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. We know the verse, and I, I'm pretty sure it was on that wonderful video, but it used to be the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3.16. 
Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We know that. We know that. It's like the first thing we learn, even if we're not going to Sunday school. We know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. But what is that? Sometimes we get so, I mean, we can quote that like off the top of our head. What does that mean? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I mean, it means what it says. But sometimes we repeat something so often, it becomes something that it's not. It just becomes something that we say. Like, goodbye. Goodbye. It, that we don't actually mean goodbye, which is just an abbreviated form of God be with you. We just say it. Goodbye. We've assumed its meaning and it's morphed, and sometimes we're not even thinking about what it actually means. God be with you. Goodbye. Have a good bye. Does that make sense? And sometimes we have verses in the Bible that we can quote with our eyes closed. Not that that would make any difference. Um, frontwards, backwards, anything. I mean, and we just say it right off the cuff. Just like in our culture, we say, I love you, I love you, I love you. But in the Greek, there were many different words for love. They didn't all mean the same thing. And unfortunately, in English, I can tell my wife that I love you, but I can also say, I love cheeseburgers. And do those mean the same thing? Hopefully not. <laughs> I love cheeseburgers. Um, <laughs> do you guys get what I'm saying? But if we really take time, that's why the Bible tells us to meditate on Scripture. Meditate on Scripture. When Joshua was going into the promised land, God gave him a commission. Meditate on Scripture day and night. Day and night. Some of us are like, oh man, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get it in any time. But God wants us to meditate on Scripture day and night so it fills our heart, so we can think about what it actually means, so it can change our lives. Amen? So when we read, for God so loved the world, what does that mean? God loves the world. God loves the world. The world, what... The world, in Psalm 24, it says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the fullness thereof and all who dwell in it. Those are the people that God loves. Everyone. Why? Because they're His. Do we realize that we're His? And I'm kind of talking off the cuff this morning, but I really want to share just something that was, that was on my heart that I was reading in Scripture. And we'll get there. We're, we're going to be in John chapter 21 this morning. But, so if you have your Bibles, you could get that ready. But when we look at what the Bible says is, God loved the world. Contrast that with what we read in Genesis. Ray, I love what you were saying about, about we were made to worship. Before God even made man, there were the articles and the items that we needed to worship the Lord. God made us in our very nature to worship Him, to interact with Him, to have relationship with Him. That's what, how we were made. And if the earth is the Lord's and everyone who dwells in it, you know, if you, usually the person who creates a thing kind of gets to decide how that thing works. Jason, could you find me a water, please? Usually when you create a thing, if you invent something, usually people don't get to come in and say how that thing works. God made us. He made the earth. He made everyone in it and everything in it. 
And he gets to decide what, what our purpose is. Not that he gets to decide, but he designed us with a purpose. And it's to worship him. It's to honor him. It's to love him. So sin messed that up. Sin separated us from God. Sin, what it, sin does is it separates us from the love of God. And all throughout Scripture, from the very first time Adam and Eve blew it, God, it says that God took skins and covered Adam and Eve. God, for the very first time ever, killed some animals and made some clothes for Adam and Eve to cover their shame. From the very beginning, from the garden, from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was sweating blood, praying before the cross, we see the love of God. God loved the world that he sent Jesus, our mediator, the Son of God, the spotless Lamb, to come and bear sin for us. What is the word said that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God? That we would be restored to relationship with God. God loved the world. He sent a son so we would not perish, but we would have relationship with him again. That's the gospel. And I know many of you in this room know that. But we need to meditate on what the Word says. In our culture, we have, a, we have a very microwave culture. We have a microwaved culture. We have microwaved interests. We, I mean, we, you know, we want our food in a minute, and we want our relationships. Just we don't want to deal with hardships. And, you know, it's like we, we have a very instant gratification type feel, and we have a very immoral culture, unfortunately. And when the nature of love is so perverted, it's impatient, well, we just read that love is patient. In our culture, love oftentimes isn't kind. It demands its own way. Well, we just, we just read that love is kind and it doesn't demand its own way. I mean, you look at that, that list, of, that defining list of, of what is love. And what it is, it's just describing God's nature, it's His character. And in our culture, we have that, we have a pretty rotten example, culturally, in the world. And that's why the church, you guys, on Valentine's Day, on any day, Jesus said that the, the people, the world will know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. As the church, can we show the love of God in the way that God intended his love to be shown to the world? Amen? So today I want to look at, uh, you can put it up there, my, the title for my message is God's Love to a Hopeless Heart. And it's a, uh, that's kind of a downer, <laughs> but Proverbs three or thirteen twelve. Many of you know this verse. It says, "Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life." Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred. What deferred? What does that mean, deferred? I mean, we know what it means, but deferred means to put off. Deferred means to delay. It means to suspend. It's a prolonging or 
uh, postponing to a later date. Oftentimes we use it most in, um, in context of deferring to experts. We defer our opinion. I will suspend my opinion to the expert. I would suspend my opinion when it comes to cars and mechanics. I just, I know I need to be uh, a manly man and fix my car and if I open the hood and that off switch is off, I'll turn it back on and, and that's, I just don't have any really desire to do that. So I need to defer to the experts. <laughs> I can, and I can change a tire and all that jazz, and I can change my oil, oil and I've replaced stuff, but it's just not my thing. I'm not an expert. Just like I wouldn't want to solve your medical issues, I would defer to the experts. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> we defer all the time. I, and I used to work at a credit union. Sometimes people would be in a hard situation, and we would be able to, under the right circumstances, work with them to defer their payments, um, put their payment off a month. And now, it might be a relief to defer to an expert or have your monthly loan payment deferred for a month or two or something like that, but what does it mean to have your hope deferred? Your hope deferred. Your expectations the things you were looking forward to, canceled. You know, last year we had a lot of situations like that with COVID, just practically. This got canceled, that got canceled. But more than that, not many in this room, thank God, but people were losing their jobs. People were losing their livelihoods. People were losing their communities. People were losing contact with their family. And in our own family, we lost loved ones. It's hope deferred. Many of us have been in that situation where our hope has been deferred. It's like the wind just gets just sucked right out of our sails. And we're sitting here like, what happened? Something doesn't, and it could, it could be just something simply doesn't go according to plan. Disappointments with people and situations, with our, our expectations, relationships, job, work, I mean, you name it. We've been in situations where our hope has been deferred, even the things we've believed God for. We're believing God for these things, and all of a sudden, things seem to be moving in the wrong direction. It's like, what, what is going on? Our hope is deferred. You know, and sometimes we're the cause of it. Sometimes we do something really dumb, maybe on purpose. And we have these consequences, and it's just like, man. But we've all been in different situations at different levels of this hope deferment, and what happens I would say we've all been in that valley of disappointment at some point of our lives, and even if we respond victoriously and Christ-like and we're full of faith, sometimes our hearts simply grow sick, and we get weary, and our heart becomes a little hopeless and heavy. And what does that word sick mean? Sick, it doesn't mean corrupt or wicked or anything like that, but when you have a sick heart, it means you have a sick heart. It's ill. It's heavy. It's grieved. And a sick heart needs to be nursed back to health. Amen? But there's good news. The good news is the good news. The good news is the gospel. The good news is that we look at Isaiah 61, and it's not up there, but Isaiah 61 says that Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord God, is upon him and has anointed him. God has an anointing to bind up the brokenhearted. 
In the Gospels, Jesus says, I didn't come, and he's talking about sin and righteousness, and more like self-righteousness, but he's saying, I didn't come for the well, I came for the sick. If you're heavy-hearted, if you're feeling sick, Jesus has come for you. Matthew chapter 11 says, if anyone is weak or weary or heavy-laden, bogged down by the weight of the world, come to me. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. What does Jesus say? My yoke is easy. You know what a yoke is? It's, a, you, it's something you put on an animal to pull a heavy cart. And Jesus is saying, my yoke, the thing that really carries you along, it's easy. It's easy. And my burden is, is light. A Norwegian joke. What's that? A yoke. Yeah, that's a Norwegian joke. A yoke. Paul. <laughs> and yokes are built for two. Amen. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> what a yoke. Not you. Um the see Jesus invites us to walk with him. Amen. So I want to look at someone today whose hope was deferred, and I want to look at how God's perfect love restored hope to his heart. Amen? So John chapter 21. John chapter 21. We're going to talk about Peter. Peter. How many guys know Peter? Simon Peter. One of the first disciples that Jesus called. Peter was a man, actually, let's just read it first. Verse 16, 17, verse 15 through 17. So Peter, John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you know or do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. And Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now, without the context, you kind of look at this, this encounter with Peter and Jesus, and you're like, why is he asking him the same question over and over, and what's with the sheep, and isn't this kind of weird? They were just having breakfast. Like, what's going on? And if you understand a little context, a little backstory is Jesus had just been crucified and he had just risen from the dead. John, the book of John talks about it at length the passion story in several chapters. Um, and so Jesus is crucified. His body is put in the tomb. The tomb is empty. Jesus appears to his disciples, but he doesn't speak to Peter. He speaks to Thomas. And Thomas was dealing with doubt, and, and, and Jesus talks to, speaks to Thomas, and he's like, look at, look at the wounds in my side. Look at the wounds in my hands. Blessed are you who believed. Um, because, if you, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. He's talking to Thomas, and then he shows up in a couple different areas, but then he's, he's gone. And I don't know how that worked, but he wasn't with the disciples. And the disciples apparently didn't know where he was. And all of a sudden, in chapter 21, it says, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. 
And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called to Didymus and Nathanael of Canaan and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. And Simon said to them, this is Peter. He said to them, I'm going fishing. I don't know about you guys, but I can't wait to go fishing. But not like Peter in this story. Because Peter, they're, t- they're tired. They're discouraged. Peter hasn't talked to Jesus since he cut off the guy's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus said, knock it off, you big dummy. Jesus didn't say that. But he said, what are you doing? That's the last time Jesus and Peter had a conversation. And you know what happened in between that? Is Jesus' word predicting Peter's betrayal came true. Not betrayal, denial three times. And Peter is around the fire in the courtyard and he's, he, a, a young girl is saying, hey, your accent sounds funny. You're one of them. And he's like, no, 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 no. And two more times, he gets accused of being one of Jesus' disciples. And the last time he says, I don't even know this guy. And that moment, the rooster crows, just like Jesus said. And in the Luke account, It says that Jesus looked over at Peter the moment he denied him the third time. This is the backstory of Peter. It says Peter left, got up and left, and wept bitterly. See, because Peter was, Peter left everything to follow Jesus. You need to understand who Peter is. Even the name Peter, we, we know people named Peter. We know Pete, our buddy Pete, Peter. I have a brother-in-law named Peter. Peter is just a name to us, but to them it was a nickname. To them it was like calling your buddy Rocky. Hey, Rocky. His name was Simon or Cephas. But they called him Peter. They called him Rocky. Even his personality was a nickname. I mean, Peter left everything. He was the one who walked on water. He was often the spokesman for all the disciples in situations, asking questions or, or, or pointing something out. Peter was the one who confessed that Jesus was the Messiah in Matthew 16. He was the one who had the revelation from the Father that Jesus was the Son of God. This is Peter. He was the most enthusiastic, ran to the, to the tomb when he heard that there was a commotion. John beat him, but he deferred to Peter and let him in. Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration and opened his mouth and said, should we make some tents for you? I hope... Maybe that has some really deep prophetic meaning that I'm just not getting, but wouldn't that be funny to have your just dumb comment recorded in Scripture for all eternity? Like, you see the Lord in his glory with Elijah and Moses on a mountain, transfigured, and his form has shaped and it has changed into utmost glory, and you say, could we make some tents? But he meant well. He's enthusiastic. He means he wants to do right by Jesus. So much so that when Jesus is, is predicting his death, saying, I'm going to bear the cross, I'm going to die and, and, and suffer this terrible thing, Peter pulls him aside and says, No, you're not. That's, that's, that's really foolish. You're our rabbi. That would be absolutely a bad idea. And he gets called Satan by Jesus, by God. Get behind me, Satan, for you don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of man. It's like, oh. I mean, Peter was invested. He was invested. He was part of Jesus' inner three disciples, his close circle of not just disciples, friends. Peter, James, and John. He went and 
he went to pray, but he fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was with Jesus during the most difficult moment of his human life. Peter was there. When Jesus wanted to wash his feet, he said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not worthy. Don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. He's like, okay, well, give me a bath. Like, I, I want to have part in you. Like, I mean, he was invested. He claimed that if even all of the disciples, all of them left him in Matthew 26, he says, if all of those leave you, I will never leave you, Jesus. And that's when Jesus says, listen, buddy. Before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Excuse me. And Peter probably heard that. He was like, you're wrong. You're wrong, Jesus. I would never do that. I would never do that. Because his heart was sincere. He was invested. But then in that courtyard, all of a sudden, he finds himself denying Christ for the third time. Something unfathomable to him. Unimaginable to his convictions and everything he holds dear. He denies Christ a third time in front of all these people that he doesn't even know. And at that very moment, Jesus just looks at him. I mean, can you imagine? I can, I can see the wind just dropping out of his sails. I can see the hope leaving his heart. Peter had hope deferred, and his heart became instantly sick. But here's the deal. That's the setting and now this is the first time Jesus and Peter have a conversation since that moment, basically. Peter says, I'm going fishing because he's just so whatever. I'm just going to go back to what I did. He was a fisherman. He went back to what was comfortable, and he was fishing, and Jesus said they weren't catching. He asked them if they were catching anything, and he said no. And he said, cast the net on the other side of the boat. And they didn't know who he was. They didn't notice that this was Jesus. But as soon as Jesus said, cast the net on the other boat, they caught a haul of fish that they, that, that, uh, they couldn't even bring it in. It was so heavy. But somehow the nets didn't break. And the moment that Peter just realized that it was Jesus, he, he put on his clothes because he was stripped up for work, but he put on his clothes and he jumped in the water and he swam to shore as fast as he could because he wanted to be with the Lord. And for the first conversation since all of this backstory, Jesus says to him, do you love me more than these? And you think of that thing that he said in Matthew 26, Lord, even if everybody else here, because they're sitting around a campfire now with all the disciples, and they're all back. But Peter was the one who said, I'll never leave you, even if, ever, even if all these guys do. And he says, do you love me more than these? And Peter's just thinking, man, last time I opened my mouth, I proclaimed my great love for you more than all of these, that I loved you the most. And here, I was the one who denied you. I mean, John didn't deny him. John was the only disciple at the cross. Everybody else left. Everybody else fled. Judas was the one who literally betrayed him, and Peter denied him. 
But in this, Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these? And Peter can't even get out an emotionally invested statement. He just affirms what Jesus says in the positive. He's just like, Jesus, you know I love you. What? Jesus, you know I love you. I mean, he's ashamed. But he just, yeah. You know I love you, Lord. And so he asks him a second time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes. Yeah, I love you, Lord, you know. And I should say the first time, what, what does Jesus say after he affirms that, yeah, I love you, Lord? Jesus says, feed my lambs. What? What, are we, what does that have to do with anything? Well, that word, tend my lambs, it means to feed, to nourish, to, to care for. And lambs is specifically, it's symbolic of, of new followers of Christ, baby Christians. Feed my lambs. It's like, okay, that's random. But no, Jesus asked him a second time, do you love me? Yeah, Jesus, yes, Lord, I, you know that I love you. And he said, okay, shepherd my sheep. I mean, shepherd is to care for, to guide, to walk alongside. And sheep are those who are under the Lord's care, believers. Believers. It's like, okay, all right, I'll shepherd your sheep. And then a third time, Jesus asks him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And now Peter gets it. Because it says Peter was grieved because Jesus said to him a third time, do you love me? And so this time Peter includes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. All of a sudden, the third time, Peter realized what Jesus was doing. Peter denied Jesus three times. And now three times, Jesus is saying, Simon, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? With each time, he's restoring a different part of Peter's heart. To where the third time Peter realizes he makes the connection. And I'm sure going through his mind was that moment the rooster crowed and the moment he locked eyes with Jesus. That third time he denied him. The crushing emotional just failure that he felt in that moment. And now he's feeling that same grief. It's, I'm sure, you know, I don't want to insert things into the text, but I'm sure it's coming back because it says that he was grieved. And he adds this to his response to Jesus. Jesus, you know how I feel. This is his first conversation. After totally blowing it. And Peter finally says, Lord, you know all things. You're God. You're resurrected right before me. You know all things. You know that I love you. Not in a, pr in a prideful way, but in a way of absolute humility from his, his past experience. And now he's saying, Lord, you know. You know what's in my heart. And so Jesus responds to him, tend my sheep. Tend my sheep. Nourish the believers. See, Jesus is smart. He's God. And He knows just what we need to have the hope fill our heart again. Oftentimes, the areas in our lives that we've just blown it the most are the very areas that God uses to heal our hearts. Isn't that amazing? If you've been burned by relationships, oftentimes God uses relationships to restore your heart again. Jesus is obsessed with redemption. He loved the world so much that he left 
matchless, endless glory to come to us. God, Emmanuel. He's given us the very ministry of reconciliation, and he says, go and do likewise. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, he says, go into all the world. I want everybody to know I love the world. Go everywhere. Go everywhere and teach them what I have taught you. Teach them to obey my commandments. Jesus restored Peter by affirming his love for him three times. What can we learn from Peter's restoration? What can we learn from this moment? The first thing is don't lose sight of your purpose. Don't lose sight of your purpose. Who does God say you are? Who does God say you are? And what has he called you to do? Don't go back fishing. If you feel, if you feel like you've blown it, if you feel like you have a disappointing situation, if you feel hopeless, if you feel disappointed, don't go back to what's just how things were. Don't go back fishing. Don't lose sight of your purpose. Go to the Lord. You know, the Israelites, when they were in, in the wilderness, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to Egypt and make bricks and slavery. It's like, why? Why? because it was familiar to them. Because they were disappointed in the wilderness because it wasn't what they expected. But you need to remind yourself of your purpose. God has called you. He's redeemed you. He calls us a son and a daughter. Of, he calls us children of God because of the cross. Don't lose sight of your purpose. Second thing is keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus. Every single question Jesus asked him. You know, do you notice how it wasn't, why did you do it, Peter? It wasn't, can you explain to me what was going on in your head when you denied me? It wasn't, Simon, son of John, do you remember when you said you wouldn't deny me? It was none of that. Jesus was having a conversation with him, and he said, Simon, son of John. He didn't even call him Rocky. I mean, he skipped nicknames here. You know what Simon means? It means hearing. Jesus levels with him and says, hey, are you hearing this? Do you love me? Each time, Jesus points to him. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When you are in a disappointing situation, you need to not lose sight of your purpose and you need to lift your eyes to Jesus, where your help comes from. And then the last thing is you need to share what he's done for you. Share what he's done for you. In Matthew chapter 10, it says, Freely you've received, freely give as he's sending the disciples out to minister. What are all those, what are the lambs and the sheep and all, what's all that about? Peter was, Peter was an apostle. Peter had a ministry. Peter had a purpose. P Peter was invested in what Jesus was doing. And so Jesus reminded him of his purpose. He's saying, listen, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Then Go take care of baby Christians. Go do what I called you to do. You're not a fisher of fish. Did you notice how there was no, I mean, you didn't read the chapter, but did you notice how they didn't catch any fish? Peter went to go fishing, and they caught nothing. Nothing. There's no grace back there, but there is grace in what God's calling you to do. Amen? And it wasn't until Jesus said, throw your nets on the other side of the boat that they started catching things. We need the grace of God in our lives. And sometimes we experience disappointments and setbacks. We experience a, a 
we get burned in a relationship, so we withdraw. And we go back to what's comfortable. We go fishing. But you know what? There's no grace when you go fishing. You're not going to catch anything. There's grace to do what God has asked you to do. We need to share in what he's asking us to do. Jesus said, tend my lambs. Take care of baby Christians. Nurse them. Nourish them. Teach them my ways. And what does he say next? Shepherd my sheep. Well, they're not baby sheep anymore. They're maturing. What does shepherding mean? It means to guide, to help, to walk alongside. He's saying, Peter, I made you to pastor people. I made you to shepherd people. I made you to come alongside people and teach them my ways. And the third time he asks, he says, tend my sheep. Nourish, again, the same word, nourish my sheep. Do you notice that Jesus did the same thing to Peter? When Peter was young and immature, Jesus nourished him. When he was maturing and growing up, Jesus shepherded him and walked alongside of him. And now in this moment, he's nourishing and caring for him again as a mature believer. And he's calling Peter to do this same thing. When God heals our hearts, we can't just stop. We need to go. If you, God has poured into your life, you need to pour that into somebody else. Jesus, uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you. Well, the Bible says, Jesus himself said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And what did he say the greatest commandments? All the law and the prophets can be summed up into these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. God made us for worship. I so appreciate what, what you shared this morning, Ray. God made us for worship, and he made us to share in his plan of redemption into all the world. And just because you get your hope deferred, just because it gets postponed, doesn't mean that it's over. It means that you need to go back to the heart of God to have him fill you back up. Fill you back up. You might have really blown it. It might be your fault. Or you might have nothing to do with it. But we're all, we've all faced situations where we, are just, we just get discouraged. And we need to get a right perspective on how God can so personally nurse our heart back to health so we can pour our lives out into other people. John, you flip the page. I don't know about in your Bible, but I flip the page and I see the book of Acts, chapter 1 and 2. Peter, this boisterous, loud mouth, hey, yo, Rocky, this guy who puts his foot in his mouth all the time, and was the only one who actually Jesus needed to say, hey, you actually denied me? Like, hey, like, let's learn from this. He was the one who stood up at Pentecost and preached the truth of God and 3,000 plus people came to know him, know the Lord, not Peter, came to know the Lord. Because he had his heart healed. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Don't stop. Jesus knows exactly how to heal a heart. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your kindness and your mercy that leads us to repentance. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness demonstrated over and over again in our lives. Father, I pray that you would help us to learn from this situation that you walked through with Peter. Lord, how you were so personal in the way that you restored his heart. God, how 
He experienced such a disappointment, such a hopeless moment in his life, and yet you restored him in exactly the way he needed. And Father, I just pray for any of us in this room who have walked through a disappointing season. Lord, where it was like the hope was sucked right out of us. God, I pray that you would touch them, touch us in a way that heals our hearts. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you that you're a personal God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not lose sight of our purpose. God, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. And Father, as you work in our lives, I pray that we would pour ourselves out to others and that we would reach out to others. Father, that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we would love others with a godly love, Lord. Leading people to you, Jesus. Father, we just pray that you would bless this week. And bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless your week, everybody.